We come to you today from a horrified and haunted community where the ripple effects of this tragedy continue to be felt on a daily basis. The people that we watched die in Grenfell Tower knew a secret of this civilization that revolves around the spectatorship of suffering that we, the spectators, do not know. I think it is really important for us at this stage to dispel some of the mythology that has been created around these tragic deaths. We know that over 20 million pounds, not to mention the Simon Cowell money from the single, has been donated by well-wishers all over the world, in fact. And in some ways, the initial phoenix that rose out of this fire was the altruism that we saw people offer and the solidarity that we saw people offer from all over the country and all over the world. The mythology that has been created around this by the corporate media has been that now people have received their money and they're completely happy. We know that the opposite is true, that in fact in some cases people have even been told that in order to receive £10,000 of these donations, they have to accept permanent housing. We know also another part of the mythology that has been created is that people have been put in luxury flats in Knightsbridge and other places. We know that that's not true, that 80% of the survivors are still in hotels, many of them up to two or possibly three people in one bed even. Another part which is really pertinent in terms of the conversation today is that the building was populated by quote-unquote undocumented migrants. Now, as people that believe in the right of movement for all people, we know that that's not important to us, but how does that work in terms of wider consumption? We look at a projection of grievances that people have with the economic philosophy of neoliberalism, which became a consensus in this country following the Callaghan government in 76, is going to the IMF for a $3.9 uh, billion loan from the IMF, and the uh, waves of privatization, deregulation, and austerity that followed that. We see those grievances that are brought about by that projected in a horizontal direction because we have a political class and a corporate media that works on creating a vertical solidarity between themselves and between those who they hope to implement their policies. So something like the idea of undocumented migrants um, occupying this, uh, this building somehow has kind of uh, space to move, really, in terms of public imagination, in terms of stripping these people of humanity, in terms of seeing them as somehow undeserving of living where they lived. Another part of the um, mythology that has been um, propagated that I think we need to work on dispelling is the idea of corporate manslaughter somehow delivering a semblance of justice. It entered the narrative very early because very prominent figures mentioned it. The CPS came out and said there was space for it. Now, when we know that despite the fact there were five layers of outsourcing on the um, cladding, that would not allow the council to obfuscate about their duty uh, regarding their duty of care. So we know that the responsibility would still return to them. And, and as I said, the CPS have come out and said there probably is room for corporate manslaughter charges. However, we know that corporate manslaughter charges would mean that any individuals that were involved in the decisions that led to this uh, situation would have impunity from legal accountability. What in the best case would happen was that it would be the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea would have to pay a fine. How would they pay that fine? They would pay it through council tax of people that live. It would be our money, essentially. So this is something that we need to be completely cognizant of. It's something that we need to, as I said, demystify as much as possible. And it's, there's a reason that it's been, become a, a, a manufactured mantra in this case. That would not be any semblance of justice. And all this revolves really around the role of the media. Now, what I wanted to hark back to in this regard 
was in 1833 when Earl Grey, who's the Prime Minister now famous for tea, that quintessentially English drink, despite the fact that there's not one tea plantation in this country, um, <laughs> abolished um, the practice of slavery and enforced bondage. Former uh, people that had lost property in this context, like David Cameron's ancestors, were awarded 20 million pounds compensation. One of the people who was a slave trader at that time uh, in the Caribbean and returned to uh, London was a man called John White. He bought land in uh, Labrook Grove, what would become Labrook Grove, and he went around, built, went about building what was called the Hippodrome. Now, the Hippodrome housed gambling, um, horse races, and whatnot. The villagers in the area mobilized against the building of the Hippodrome for several reasons, because most importantly, it was going to cut off an important footpath. Now, at that process, in that struggle between the power of big business and the power of local people to organize, the Times newspaper, of all people, took the side of the villagers. Now, this was very significant and, in fact, pivotal in what happened. Because the, time, the Times were coming out and writing about this in a way which was uh, really serving as agents of people rather than agents of power at that time in 1833, what you had is even jockeys refusing to race in the Hippodrome, and eventually the villagers won. Now, the reason I make that point is because Labrick Grove, as an area, has a very rich history of Number one, the phoenix that arises out of great tragedy and um, lack of accountability um, on the part of government and big business. It's not just the case of the Hippodrome in 1833, but you also have the Notting Hill Carnival, for example, which came out of the road which today is, very, is overlooked by Grenfell Tower, Bramley Road. In uh, 1958, you had Oswald Mosley encouraging people to firebomb, quote unquote, teddy boys, fire, firebombing houses that were lived in by people that came from the Caribbean in the Windrush after the Second World War to rebuild um, this country after it was bombed by the Nazis in the Second World War. So those houses were being firebombed. But we did not see any real accountability in that context. Then you had the murder of Kelso Cochrane in 1959. Again, nobody arrested. What came out of that? What came out of that was the free school. What came out of that was an assertion of Caribbean presence within that part of London that today is one of, if not the biggest, festivals in Europe. That was the victory that came off the back of that. We must cling to a, a, perception, a conception of history which is not top-heavy. If it wasn't for William Cuffey and the Chartists, would people that are not landed gentry have the right to vote in this country? If it wasn't for the toll puddle martyrs, would people have the right to organize and fight for their rights? Out of all of these situations of great tragedy and lack of accountability of government and corporate power, human beings come together and organize and fight for their rights. And that is what we are a contemporary example of all of us in this room. So thank you very much.